I am delighted to be with you and to be a part of this great program again every year. It just gets gooder and gooder, as the little boy said. And we really do appreciate the chance to be a part of it. Now, what is the simple truth about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Now, who gets to answer that question? Who gets to decide what truth is when it comes to this subject or any subject for that matter? But you know there are a lot of different views that are held on this and so which one is the truth? And is it really that simple? These are the questions I wish to address tonight. Now I want to point out that if atheistic evolution is true, there's no explanation for the origin of marriage, for the rules concerning it or controlling it. It's all just happenstance and each society just makes their own rules as their society dictates. But if there is a universal creator and marriage belongs to him and he made it, then he can control it, can he not? Is it not his to decide what is right and what is wrong? And you see, that's the bottom line of this whole issue. It's not what brother so-and-so might have said that is the definitive final issue, although he might have worded it well and helped us. And I'll even quote one brother in particular near the end of the message that helped uh, me with a good illustration on this, I think. But it's all, the bottom line is it all boils down to there is a God in heaven, Daniel 2.28, and he has spoken from heaven to man in this book right here. You remember... The statement is the simple truth. Well, what is truth? In John 17 and verse 17, we're told, thy word is truth. I think of Psalm 33 and verse 4, for the word of the Lord is right, and all of his works are done in truth. And then if you'll go with me in your Bible for just a moment to Psalm 119, I want you to zoom in on what's stated in verse 141, particularly that last phrase in Psalm 119, verse 141, where the Bible just comes right out and says, thy law is truth. Make it verse 142. That'd be even better since that's where it is. 142. Thy law is the truth. Now go to verse 151. Verse 151, and you'll notice the statement, last part of the verse, all thy commandments are truth. And so when it comes to the simple truth about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, this has to be our standard. It cannot be the latest poll or what the congregation wants or what uh, someone thinks that uh, the congregation wants, it has to be about what God said in his inspired book. And so with that said, I want to now ask these three questions. First, what's the simple truth about marriage? The bottom line about marriage is just so clearly shown to us in Genesis chapter 2. You remember that God had made everything, and everything that he'd made was good, 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 and good some more. And I want you to keep in mind that the first thing he saw that wasn't good was that man should be alone. But he took care of that. And aren't we grateful that he did? There in Genesis chapter 2, you'll notice that the Bible says in verse number 23 that Adam, as he looks at the bride that God has brought him, the Lord God in verse 21 caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And the, the rib, verse 22, the Lord took from man, from that he made a woman, brought her unto the man, and then Adam says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And therefore, the editorial comment is given, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Did you notice something in this passage that's so simple and still so true today? God's design for marriage, his original design for marriage involved a male and a female. It involved one male and one female. God did not bring two females to Adam and say, here are your wives. He did not bring a man to Adam and say, here is your helpmeet. 
the God of this universe who controls it made a woman, brought her to the man, and that's his design. Someone says, but I don't like that. I say this all the time, but I say it because I still believe it's true. If you don't like God's system or design for marriage, then here's what you do. You go out and create a universe, create some human beings of your own, and you can come up with whatever rules you want to. But wait a minute, you say, I, I, I can't do that. Right. That's exactly the point, is it not? You and I cannot do that, and so what do we do? We bow to the one who could do it, who did do it, and we acknowledge his superiority and wisdom and power to us. Because we can't do what he could do, I tip my hat to him every time and say, God, you know what, all things. You know what is best. And so one man, one woman, together for life. That's the original simple truth about marriage. How far do you have to read in the Bible before you see people corrupting that simple design for marriage? Not far. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 19, Lamech took to himself two wives. And so it began. And then you read in Genesis chapter 6 that the sons of God were looking at the daughters of men and saw that they were fair and they chose to them any wife they wanted to. They chose any wife without regard to any other consideration. It was all about physical beauty and not about anything spiritual. And the next thing you know, the world has become so corrupt that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually, and then God has to destroy the world with a flood. And I would suggest to you that a lot of the downfall of the society that led to it being destroyed by a flood was not paying attention to God's rules for marriage. That's where it started. Now, as you think about this, Esau, 40 years old, when he takes a couple of wives that were Hittites, and how did that work for him and for the family? The Bible says these women were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Genesis chapter 26, verses 34 and 35. And then read with me Deuteronomy chapter 7, because here is God regulating the people whom they can marry. Now, do they say, wait a minute, who do you think you are to tell us who we can and cannot marry? No. Because God had every right to regulate marriage, it's his, it belongs to him. And so he told them as his covenant people, verse 3 of Deuteronomy 7, don't make marriages with these Canaanites, those people in the promised land, no. Thy daughter thou shalt not give to his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Why not? They'll turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods, and he warns them explicitly not to do this. File that away for what we come back to later in the message. What was the simple truth about God's law for marriage for them as far as the people they could marry in the land of Canaan? He told them, don't marry these folks. Did God have the right to tell them that or not? Yes or no? He did. Now, Jesus, did you change the truth on marriage because centuries had passed between Genesis 2 and your comments on it in Matthew 19? Jesus, did you in Mark chapter 10, in Mark's account, change your views or change the scriptural view of what marriage is? I want you to go to Mark 10 with me and notice that the original question in Mark chapter 10, interestingly enough, was not even about getting married. It wasn't even about getting remarried. The original question that they asked Jesus in Mark chapter 10 was about putting away, which we'll address next. In verse 2 of Mark 10, the Pharisees came to him. They asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? And they were tempting him when they asked this question. Now, it's interesting, Matthew doesn't tell us the blow-by-blow -blow way in which this all unfolded. He just gives some summary statements, but uh, there was obviously some back and forth going on between Jesus and the individuals asking him this, because you see them in Matthew's account making a claim that Moses had commanded this writing of divorcement, and then Jesus is saying, well, what did Moses command you, command you? And they said, well, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to, to put her away. And Jesus, what's your response to this? For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept, but 
from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and there'll be one flesh. And verse 9, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. How many times have you heard that at a wedding ceremony? Is that still applicable tonight? Yes. Was it applicable in Mark chapter 10? Yes. It was still just as true as it was in Genesis chapter 2. And so the simple truth about marriage has been transgenerational. It has covered different covenants and ages of Bible history. It's not peculiar to one age of Bible history. It's a universal ordinance. I want you to notice next, what's the simple truth about divorce? The simple truth is that God hates it, Malachi 2.16. He doesn't want it to occur. In fact, I think it's interesting in Mark's account of this whole equation, in verse number 10, in the house, his disciples ask him again about what the Pharisees had asked him about earlier in the chapter. And he says unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. Did you notice something missing? In Mark 10 and verse 11, there is no accept it before clause. Jesus, what are you doing? I'm giving you the general rule. Now some have made the erroneous allegation that because this was spoken to his disciples, that it was a rule only for his followers and that others would not be bound by this same rule. But I want you to go to Luke's account in Luke 16 of another episode where Jesus is addressing the Pharisees in Luke 16 and verse 14. They were by no means his followers. They did not want him to do what he was doing. They were fighting against him every which way. And what did Jesus tell the Pharisees in Luke 16, 18? Whosoever putteth away his wife, notice it doesn't say next, except it be for fornication. It just says, whosoever puts away his wife and marries another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is put away from her husband, committeth adultery. And so what's going on here? Is Jesus contradicting himself? By no means. He's simply giving the general rule on these occasions, but uh, he would also add more information in other passages and accounts. Now, when I was a student at Fried Hardeman, some of you may have uh, been students back in the days of Bader Gymnasium, and uh, you might even remember this. When I was a student there in the early 80s, there was a sign, a little placard, up over the door of the gym as you entered it said no food or drink in the gym and then you go to the other door it said no food or drink in the gym one of the doors had this little placard hanging right next to it except during ball games so what's the general rule the general rule is no food or drink in the gymnasium are there any exceptions to that rule? Yes, there is one, except during ball games. There's your exception. And so what's the general rule? Don't divorce your mate and then get married again on top of it. Don't do that. That's the general rule. Are there ever any exceptions to this general rule? The answer is emphatically yes. In fact, I would invite your attention to Matthew chapter 5. And this is Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 31, it has been said, and isn't it interesting that throughout the Sermon on the Mount, six times, Jesus says, here's what you've heard people say, but here's what I'm going to say to you. And three of those six times, he said, here's what you've heard of old time. This is something you've been hearing for a long, long time. But I'm going to tell you this. Now, what had they been hearing? They'd been hearing, well, verse 31, if you want to put away your wife, just do it. Give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, now watch, saving for the cause of fornication, 
causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Now how is it that by my putting away my wife for a reason other than fornication, I cause her to commit adultery? How could that possibly be? If I put away my wife for a reason other than fornication, that's not a scriptural reason, and she does not have me anymore because I put her away, and she's going to be tempted to contract another relationship, which she has no scriptural right to do, in which case, if she does do that, my putting her away for a cause other than fornication contributed to her becoming an adulterer. That's what the Bible says emphatically in this passage. And so it is a big deal. The simple truth about divorce is, I don't want you to do it. I don't want you to do it. Except, and here's the only time you're permitted to do it, saving for the cause of fornication. Now you'll go to Matthew 19 and you'll notice that in Matthew 19, as this conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees unfolds, what do you notice in this text? Matthew chapter 19. The Bible says that he tells them, look, you think Moses was granting you the liberty to just divorce and, and remarry for any reason of your choosing that he was commanding you? to No, no. That was something permitted only because of the hardness of your hearts, not because that's God's original ideal or plan. In fact, he says in verse number 8 of Matthew 19, last phrase, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, now he's going to give it a clause that we don't read in Mark's account or Luke's account, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now if you've ever wondered whether preachers are being too strict with their teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and you think that maybe they're not nearly as loving as Jesus was, and that we've just somehow become hypercritical of those who are divorced, and that we've somehow lost our love for them, I, I want you to notice the disciples' interpretation of what Jesus said is quite telling, is it not? In verse 10, his disciples say unto him, well, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it's not good to marry. If that's the only reason for which you could divorce and subsequently remarry with divine approval, then it seems like you'd be better off not to get married than to be in a marriage where you've only got one out, one, one exception, one escape. If, if it becomes necessary to leave the marriage, this seems like there, there ought to be more. This is the, Jesus says, well, look, not everyone's going to accept this saying or receive it. Say they to whom it is given. He said, some, I will tell you, they're eunuchs because they were born that way from their mother's womb. They had no choice in the matter. Some were made eunuchs because other men made them eunuchs. They had no choice in the matter. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive him, let him receive it. But if he's going to get married, here are the rules, and they apply. Now, I remember very vividly a man coming to me in my very first work. And after talking with him, it became very clear that he did not have a right to remarry, and he knew it. He wasn't to trying to get someone to convince him that he was okay. But he told me this. He said, look, in my early 20s, I made a tragic choice and decision. I lost my wife to it, and I am now in a position where I cannot scripturally remarry as long as I live. He was white-haired and advanced in years when I met him, but he'd lived for decades, making himself a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake because he realized that to do otherwise would violate divine teaching. Now, he's passed on long ago since I met him. I want to ask you something. If he remained faithful till the day of his death in the ways that God demanded of him and required of him in his word, 
Will heaven surely be worth it all, yes or no? Well, that seems so confining and so cruel. My friends, would you rather have 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe 60 or even 70 years of marital companionship and lose your soul forever or live faithfully to God as a single individual as Paul was capable of doing without never getting married. He, he never got married. And so it's possible to live faithfully for God and, and not get married or not get remarried. Wouldn't it be better to follow God's divine plan than to lose your soul forever in torment? That's what this boils down to. Now the simple truth about remarriage is the last thing I want to notice before I start giving you some, some views that people have come up with that I want to give you some simple answers to refute. The simple truth about remarriage is this. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Now, the meaning of this passage is not complicated. I'm contending in loving ways tonight that the, the truth on marriage, divorce, and remarriage is simple. The only thing that makes it appear to be complicated are the choices people make in violation of God's clear teaching, not the teaching itself. That's what seems to complicate things. Guy in Woods was a favorite of so many of us in this room, I'm sure, here tonight. I don't worship the man. I never did. But I do think that he said something so wise when he told the story that I'm about to tell you. And this was one of the last sermons that he preached before he passed from this life. And I'm sure he said it many times in many places. But I heard him say this. He said someone came up to him and said, Brother Woods, we have such respect for your years of study and scholarship, and we've been in a real uh, controversy about Matthew 19.9 and what it teaches about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And so what we're asking you to do is to delve into this passage and give us your critical analysis of Matthew 19.9. After all your years of study, what do you think the best and simplest explanation of that passage is? And Brother Wood said that he said in response to them, I will give you my analysis of the passage. The passage means, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Brother Woods, I don't think you understand what we're asking you to do. I appreciate that. We know what the verse you know, how it reads, but we want you to give us an exegesis of it. I mean, delve into the nuances of the language and all of the text and everything that it says, and please give us your exegesis, your commentary on Matthew 19.9. And Brother Wood said, all right, here is my commentary on Matthew 19.9. Whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. And then he said this, and I will never forget him saying it. The passage doesn't need explaining as much as it needs believing. And that's still true tonight. Now, am I cold-hearted and calloused about this subject? No, I am not. In fact, I'm going to tell you before I look at some ways in which people have tried to justify staying in a marriage that doesn't meet these scriptural requirements. I'm going to tell you that years ago in a local work I was doing, there was a young couple that came to us. They were on fire for the Lord. The young woman had actually quit her job at the fitness club where she worked because she said, the clothes they require me to wear there are so tight and form-fitting that I do not feel like Christian modesty would allow me to work there anymore under those circumstances. She was there every time the doors were open. I baptized her uh, into Christ. 
her husband had been a member of the Lord's Church, uh, and then she uh, had a Bible study with me afterwards, and I had even asked about uh, their original situation, their marriage, and she said that her husband had uh, cheated on her and that she had divorced him. And so I believed the best first, because that's what love does until it has other evidence to believe otherwise. One Sunday morning, I was preaching a sermon, and I didn't even comment on Matthew 19, 9. I merely quoted it. And after services, the husband came up to me, and he said, If what I just heard you preach in your sermon is true, I'm afraid I might be living in adultery. I said, I hope that's not the case, but let's sit down and talk about it. And here's what happened. While she was still married and her husband was away on business, she, in her loneliness, she said, met this man at the pool, the public pool, another sermon for another time. And she said that as they began to gaze at one another at the public pool, they both were attracted to one another. And the next thing you know, she said, we were together. And I said, now, you, while you were married, were together with this man? She said, yes. I said, so you were guilty of committing adultery? Yes. The Lord never envisioned Matthew 19, 9 being used by a guilty party to put away another equally guilty party. Someone says, but the divorce dissolves the connection or the bond between the two parties. But Brother Gus Nichols was uh, wise enough and others were wise enough to note that uh, there are some other handcuffs involved in this relationship. And people have responded to uh, some of these arguments that some of these preachers have made by noting that you're also tied to God and your obligations to Him. And that's what makes this an issue. And so heartbroken, I talked to them and realized more and more that they did not have a right to be together. They seemed so perfect for each other. When I got home that night, I walked in my house and my wife met me at the door. I'm not trying to be dramatic, I'm just telling you what happened. I just started crying. She said, what is wrong? And I said this, this must be how it starts for some preachers, but pray it will not happen to me. What are you talking about? I said, for a fleeting moment, for a fleeting moment on the way home, this thought flashed through my mind. This couple seems to be so perfect for each other. There's got to be a way that they can stay together. And then I realized I'm not making the decisions about who has the right to stay together and who does not. I am obligated to follow the wisdom of one greater than I, smarter than I, more loving than I. You can't say that God would give these rules because he doesn't care about people. Because let me ask you this, how many broken-hearted children more would we have if God's rules weren't so strict about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? And so I said, you pray with me right now that I will never waver from the truth, no matter how much I like the couple involved. And we prayed that prayer. And I wept those tears. I know that if my children ever make a decision to get married and then violate these rules, I will still love my children. I will. I will still love my children. But I will never, as God is my witness, pray for me, I will never allow myself to suddenly decide that maybe the Bible's not as clear as I thought it was on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Have you ever heard uh, this statement, no man turns against reason until reason turns against him? 
think Hume might have made that comment. I know this. Very few men that I've ever met, no man I've ever met, as a matter of fact, has turned against the simplicity of the teaching of Jesus on marriage, divorce, and remarriage until that teaching turned against him or a family member. And then suddenly we have to restudy the issue. My friends, there are some simple answers I want to give you in closing to this subject. Number one, one error you hear is this. The truth on this subject is so elusive that you can't really know the truth on this subject. I know of a congregation where my dad once preached where the eldership got up before the membership and said the following. We have just returned from a seminar on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And after attending the seminar and hearing all the different views presented by so many different good brethren, we have decided that uh, as an eldership, we don't have a position on the subject. And so we will not ask any questions about your marriage or your divorce or your remarriage because this thing is so murky that if good brethren can't agree on it, then it must not be something that God expects us to really settle. Is it true or false that 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says adulterers shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Does the Bible say that or not? Yes or no? Do you believe for one moment that Almighty God would make something a salvation issue and then fail to give us enough information to be able to figure out whether we're guilty of the sin that would damn our soul? Do you think for one moment that God said, adulterers, you're not going to make it to heaven? I didn't give you enough information in this book to really clearly show you whether you are or are not an adulterer, so uh, just, you know, good luck. That's blasphemy. I promise you that Galatians 5, which listed as one of the works of the flesh, verses 19 to 21, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and following, the Bible is not muddy or murky on this subject. It is absolutely clear. And we must not back down from teaching the truth on it just because some individuals have determined that they're going in a different direction. We've got to be loving, but we've got to be firm. Now here's one you hear. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not a part of the New Testament, and therefore the marriage laws that are taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do not apply to New Testament Christians because those things were said before Jesus died on the cross, and the testament is a force after men are dead, Hebrews 9, 15 to 17. Jesus said those things before he died, so that's Old Testament legislation, not New Testament legislation, and therefore we don't have to uh, hold people accountable to those things. Have you ever heard that? How accurate is that? Well, wait a minute. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, true, they do record some events and teaching that took place prior to Jesus' death on the cross, but when were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John written? After the establishment of the church after the New Testament came into force. And that's why they're properly put as a part of our New Testament. And besides, it's interesting, isn't it? People want to get rid of Matthew 19 because, oh, it has those marriage laws in it. Do you know in the previous chapter, Matthew 18, Jesus gave legislation for how to deal with a situation. If you have a fault with a brother, you go to him and him alone. If that doesn't work it out, you get two or three others to go with you. And if that doesn't work it out, you tell it to the, the church. Wait a minute. Matthew's an Old Testament document. The church is a New Testament thing, we're told. Friends, Matthew was written in the New Testament age. And Jesus gave some anticipatory legislation that would be binding in the new covenant age, such as, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's John 3, 5. Let me ask you, can we bind John 3, 5 on people today, yes or no? If you say yes, 
then how can you then get rid of Matthew 19 and say it's not binding? You've got to take it all. Now, a close cousin to this view that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not a part of the New Testament is the view that says, well, non-Christians are not amenable to the law of Christ anyway, and thus they're not accountable to his marriage law. Stop. If they're not amenable to the law of Christ, how do they become sinners? The Bible says that sin is the transgression of what? The law, 1 John 3, 4. If I'm not amenable to the law of Christ, then how, pray tell, would I become a sinner and violate a law I'm not even amenable to? If I have violated that law, then I'm accountable to it. And I'm accountable to how much of it? All of it. And that needs to be clearly understood. Tell me how the Corinthians could have been guilty of the things Paul indicts them for. You were idolaters, effeminate, you were drunkards, you were revilers, you were extortioners. You, how could they have been any of those things if they hadn't been under the law of Christ? They were under the law of Christ, and they needed the forgiveness that only comes through Christ. And interesting, Hebrews seven twelve makes this clear. The Bible says that with the, pre, the change of the priesthood, there's what? A change of the law. And guess when Jesus became high priest? He's the high priest right now. He, he is the high priest and the law of Christ, the sacrificial system that saves me, is not the law of Moses, it's the law of Christ. And that's true for everyone. Now have you heard this next one? Baptism washes away sins. Therefore, the sin of adultery I committed in the past has a, is a sin that's been washed away. I'm no longer an adulterer because that sin was washed away. Let me ask you, first of all, is baptism the only requirement for the remission of sins, yes or no? It's not the only thing. Peter said in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Can I ask you something? Did Jesus say, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? Yes. If someone told you, I do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, would you still baptize them, yes or no? Well, you'd better not. What if someone says, yeah, I'm living in a sinful situation, but I don't plan to get out of it? Well, baptism will wash that away. Okay, here's a thief. He's embezzled $25,000 from his company. What if he says this? Baptism washes away all sins. I stole that money before I was baptized. Therefore, the sin of stealing that money has been washed away, and therefore, it's forgiven, and I can keep the money. Yes or no? If Farmer John can't steal Farmer Joe's wife, if he can't steal Farmer Joe's cows, rather I should say, without having to give them back, pray tell what doctrine allows Farmer Joe to, or John to steal Farmer Joe's wife and, and not have to give her back. I'm telling you, this idea is simply, simply inappropriate for us to overlook because repentance is a requirement and baptism does not wash away consequences. Notice next, someone says, the Apostle Paul gave an additional reason for divorce and remarriage in 1 Corinthians seven fifteen. If I'm deserted by my mate, then I'm not under the marriage bond anymore. A couple of things. Paul knew very well what the word for the marriage bond was in Greek. In fact, he used it in verse 27. He used it in verse 39. He did not use the word for the marriage bond in verse 15. He used a different word for bondage there. Now, if he's referring to the marriage bond, why wouldn't he use the word that he used in other places in the passage to refer to the marriage bond? Because he's not referring to the marriage bond in 1 Corinthians 7, 15. And there is a tense used. It's a perfect passive participle negative. Therefore, here's the force of it. It literally means was not bound and is not bound. And never would be bound. You are so devoted to Christ, yes, but you, your marriage to your partner, you've never been under such bondage to your partner that you would be required to give up your faith in Christ to keep them from leaving you. 
You have never been under such bondage, and you are not now under such bondage, and you never will be. And then someone else says, well, you know, preacher, a, a loving God would never expect an unscripturally married couple to rectify their situation by ending the marriage, especially if children are involved. And I want to close out my comments by going to Ezra chapter 10 with you for a principle here that certainly needs to be remembered. Remember the argument is a loving God would never require couples who are unscripturally married, who have children, to separate. In Ezra chapter 10, what's going on here? Remember I said, remember Deuteronomy 7? God told them, don't marry strange wives, foreign wives. Don't do it. What are they doing here? What have they done here in Ezra 10? Verse number 2, Shechaniah says to Ezra, we trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land, but now there's hope concerning this thing and we're just never going to do it again. That's not what he says. He doesn't say, let's all promise that what we did in the past, we'll ask God to forgive us for, and then we'll never do it again. These are covenant people, by the way. They were already in a covenant relationship with God. And you'll notice that the, the Bible says here in this verse, verse 3, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives, watch, and such as are born of them. According to the counsel of my Lord, and watch this part because it does take this. And of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. I'm telling you, it takes courage to do what some have done and I admire them so much for doing it. Verse 4 says, be of good courage and do it. There's some weeping going on. The last phrase in verse 1, they wept very sore. I've cried tears, you've cried tears. And we're always going to be doing that. But look at the last part of this chapter, Ezra chapter 10. And we'll just look at verse 10 and 11. I'll close out here. Ezra tells them, you've transgressed. You've taken strange wives. Now, therefore, just say you're sorry and everything will be okay. No. Verse 11, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers. Do his pleasure. And in addition to the words that you speak, Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. And did you notice what the people said? Verse 12, as thou hast said, so must we do. I'm not standing here and telling you that it's not emotional or that it's just easy. But I'm standing here and telling you that I don't want to stand on the day of judgment and have you look at me and say, preacher, you knew the simple truth about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Why didn't you tell it to me? Let us all dedicate ourselves to the proclamation of the simple truth about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Let's do it with compassion, but let's do it with conviction and clarity and never back away from what God's Word says.